Thanks for the invitation to speak today, Peter and, and, and Sue. I thought I'd just, well, first of all, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners, the uh, elders past, present and future uh, emerging. And I thought I'd just run through briefly philosopher's life and, uh, and his achievements. This photo you might have seen in the exhibition. It's taken at uh, the house at the 4th, which is still standing behind the, the roadhouse, 688 4th Road. I love this photo. Uh, it's James and Mary Jane, his wife, and their two eldest children, uh, Annie and Leslie. It's just great to see a philosopher with a smile on his face and looking contented. So this is at a time in his life when he was, uh, he discovered the Mount Bishop of Tin and he or was fated as a popular hero in Tasmania. So just to uh, give you a quick rundown on, on his beginnings, uh, I guess some of you will know philosopher Smith, James Smith was born along the, alongside the Tamar River to ex-convict parents, John and Smith. Uh, he was effectively orphaned by his mother and also uh, he had that stigma of, of ex-convict parents. And to me, these are probably two of the great drivers be behind this achievement ethic that he had. It's a fairly common theme in Tasmania that uh, there's a stigma attached to having convict parents and that people... Well, of course, it was unspoken. You didn't talk about uh, having convict parents. Nobody even talked about... It. Well, and of course, well into the 20th century. And for some people, right to the end of the 20th century, didn't want to talk about their convict lineage. He was adopted by and apprenticed to flour miller John Gullen at the Supply River Mill, but James Smith, uh, I'm sure he was quite capable as a miller, but his mind was always elsewhere. He was interested in the bush, he was interested in minerals, he was interested in exploring. And he had little formal education, so he was self-educated, and this uh, is a theme that was also passed down to, to uh, philosopher's son, Ron Smith, Major Smith, who was a terrific self-educator. So these are people of extremely inquiring minds. And I think, as I said, I think he had this drive to prove himself from a very young age. I, I'm, you know, I can only uh, surmise that from, from his life. He didn't ever write it, of course. He didn't ever talk about his, his life uh, in that manner. So it was a no-brainer for him to go to the Victorian gold rushes uh, he was also disappointed in love. I imagine that uh, going to Victoria was, was a, a really good break for him. So at the Victorian gold rushes, he made a little bit of money. We know that because he's, he was able to buy property when he returned to Tasmania. And he learned the, the basic survival skills, how to operate in the bush, he learned how to find gold. And there are some elements of his character. So he's 25 years old. There are elements of his character coming out very strongly already. One is his commitment to non-violent protest. And he rides in the gold escort. And this independent thought that characterised his whole life is already there. So in 1853, he had enough money to put a down payment on a 640-acre block. Uh, so that's outlined in blue at the, at the Clayton's Rivulet, so uh, fourth is just over here, near fourth. And what he did in the end was he, he, he kept this 140 acres and he sold his right to the other 500 acres because he wanted to use that money to fund prospecting. So he got about 200 pounds. Now, this was a very tough way to make a living. This is uh, the wastelands of the colony. This is forested land. So uh, it, land was available on very easy terms, but you had this heartbreaking task of clearing the forest, ring barking trees, rubbing out the stumps, planting potatoes in the ashes. Uh, and it's during a great uh, period of depression in Tasmania, so potatoes are virtually worthless at market. Uh, same with wheat, and wheat is a very difficult crop to grow in Tasmania. So he did pretty much anything he could in these early years to make a living. And by 1859, he felt that he was in a position where he could start to prospect. 
So he's, he cut a, a track up the Fourth River and up the Wilmot River over Black Bluff and he made some discoveries of gold and silver and copper um, in that area uh, near, near Lorena, the gold discovery was near modern day Lorena on the Upper Fourth and he did other things to, to try and make a living. He uh, cut tracks for the government. Um, he also tried pining. He got up as far as Pencil Pine Creek near Cradle Mountain and he discovered that there were pencil pines growing along the riverbank and he knew the quality of the timber and he realised that if he actually felled trees that fell into the Pencil Pine Creek that eventually they would float down the Fourth River system and he had a saw pit at the Fourth River Heads and sometimes it would take years for these trees to appear, these logs to come downstream and he had a saw pit about where, I suspect, about where the, the highway now crosses the Fourth River, where the Fourth River Bridge is and he must have had a bullock team or a horse team to haul these logs out of the river uh, at that point and, and uh, cut them up and he was selling timber. Some went to it, for example, to a church that was being built in Stanley and quite a bit went to Launceston for building timber. But some of the logs came down in a, in a, fr in a fresh, disappeared in a bass strait and were never seen again. One turned up on the beach uh, near where, where the Denport air or Airport is now. So he had to actually carve his initials into the logs just to make sure that he could claim them. And uh, he got a lot of discouragement during this period. This was really his, his, the period of his education as a prospector, 1859 to 71. So at one stage he was sending some produce up to his agent in Launces and potatoes and, and uh, wheat. One load of wheat, uh, the uh, agent said, don't bother sending me any more of that, it's complete rubbish. And he was also told, the sooner you wind up the better, meaning you might as well sell out as a farmer, you're just not going to ever make it. And also he was disparaged as a pro prospector on occasions, uh, and I'll put one quote there, talking about ridiculous announcements of this man who's running, running around in the highlands finding little bits of gold that, that, are, that are worthless. He also very much uh, came to understand nature, and uh, he wrote quite a bit about uh, natural uh, features he saw like Winterbrook Falls. And you can still find quite a few of the small uh, mining shows that he discovered during this period. This is one at Copper Creek on the Lee River. You can see these mining addicts uh, quite, uh, that were opened up at that time. And this was one of those small shows that was reworked years and years later. And the big, big breakthrough was the Penguin Silver Mine. A lot of people live at Penguin and don't even know there ever was a Penguin Silver Mine. It was right on the beach at Penguin. Um, and when he'd made this discovery in 1861, he made a number of mineral discoveries around the... Sorry, I'm standing behind another microphone. Behind the um, Penguin up in the Dial Range and along the, the seashore at Penguin. The trouble was, in 1861, there was no legislation that nobody could take out a lease on the seashore. They had to wait six years before a new law was passed and nobody could get a lease. So there are a number of issues. Uh, they're also very timid investors. His own partners were very, and he, he himself, were very inexperienced as businessmen. But ultimately the problem with the Penguin Silver Mine was there was a small resource. So it was a mine with great hopes. Uh, and at one stage Penguin looked like being the leading light in, in Tasmania as a mining centre. Even had a mining institute at one time. So in 1871 the Penguin Silver Mine collapsed. But even as that was happening, philosopher had it set his sights somewhere else. Uh, and it was partly because of this gentleman, Skelton Emmett, who was a prospector uh, in the Circular Head area. He was washing gold on the middle reaches of the Arthur River. And James Smith would have said to himself, well, where is that gold coming from? It's got to be coming from Mount Bischoff, which is at the headwaters of the Arthur. So he set his sights on visiting Mount Bischoff. So, just imagine at the time, there is a very rough track, um, probably used by stockmen going up towards Hampshire and Surrey Hills, uh, and he made his way up that, into that country and he camped at Knoll Plain, which is a couple of kilometres south of here, and a big open plain, 
It was this one track which had been blazed a few years earlier. So he took Burgess's track to the headwaters of the Arthur. His plan was to come down the Arthur look, panning for gold. And that's what he did. So coming down the Arthur, he discovered Philosopher Falls. And after a while, he lost the uh, signs of gold in his pan. And he realised the strike of the rocks was not propitious for finding gold. So he started to look for other minerals. And he got down here to the confluence of Tinstone Creek, or Tin Creek as he called it, and the Arthur River, and he washed something that looked like tin in his dish. So there's quite a bit of mythology attached to the discovery of tin at Mount Bischoff. Did it happen on the mountain? Was it, you see depictions like these of uh, the discovery on the mountain. Gloucester Smith is discovering tin on the mountain. Well, he, no, it didn't. Uh, you also read, and I've read this quite a bit, that, but Smith was so hungry that he ended up eating his dog. Um, and there was also the claim he didn't know tin when he saw it, which was completely ridiculous because he'd been on the Victorian goldfields. He knew what tin looked like. <coughs> so this is the... This is the, I've just tripped over a rock. This is the uh, actual place of discovery at that confluence of um, Tinstone Creek. Uh, you can see it's Tinstone Creek by the dreadful yellow colour coming out of it, a bit of acid mine drainage, uh, with the Arthur River. And this is his dog Bravo, who he had, a, he always had dogs on his prospecting expeditions. This dog Bravo uh, helped him out at Mount Bischoff when he ran out of food by capturing an echidna, which he could eat. So here's Bravo, back at the Fourth River, having survived um, the trip, and no bite marks. This photo was taken quite a few years later at that house at the Fourth River. So it's really interesting. Uh, Smith has been visited by a professional photographer, Peter Laurie Reed, and he's made a point of having a photo taken with his dog, so he really valued Bravo. This is James Smith applying for his first leases. So here's the southern tin, tin lease at Mount Bischoff. He also applied for two other leases, the zinc and the antimony, nothing came of those. So at this time, March 1872, he applied for leases. And then there was a, a terrible trip in July 1872 where the surveyors, Charles Sprint and David Jones and Smith had to make their way to Mount Bischoff to survey the land. Now just imagine the top of Mount Bischoff is covered in horizontal scrub. So it was a, a very difficult trip. They came to Knoll Plain, which is the place you can see photographed here, uh, south of Bischoff, and they blazed a track through to Mount Bischoff, and that was the track that was used for years by the uh, horse and bullock teams that carted the original ore out, out of Bischoff. In uh, 1873, after a period of haggling with businessmen in Melbourne and uh, finally in Launceston, Mount Bischoff Tin Mining Company was formed. James Smith uh, had learned his lessons, learned how to be a businessman through that debacle with the Penguin Silver Mine when he was very inexperienced. He found himself in a position of power unprecedented by a Tasmanian mineral prospector at that time. So as a settlement with the Mount Bischoff Tin Mining Company, he got 1,500 pounds he got 4,400 shares, paid up shares in the company, and he was made a director for life, and he had the power to appoint one other director. So he occup effectively occupied two of the seven directorships in the company. Three years later, he resigned over a dispute about mine management of Third Kaiser, the second manager of the mine. Um, on the left, you've got a, I've got a photo there of uh, W. M. Crosby, his, his own... Uh, it was Smith's right-hand man, the original mining manager at Mount Bischoff. Smith would have, would have preferred to sack Kaiser and go back to Crosby, who was the original manager. And he wrote, when he resigned, I could no longer endure the torture of being a director in connection to the present mining management. So. This is fairly typical James Smith behaviour. He was a, a retiring man and when he was offended he tended to withdraw. Uh, and this is a, a, there's a pattern of behaviour throughout his life. So I think there's a couple of issues going on here in this arg argument uh, over 
who should, whether Kaisers, Kaisers should be allowed to, to manage the mine. And one is uh, this idea of professional status. Uh, mining engineers like Kaiser, Kaiser had been through the Klaus style school of mines. He was a qualified mining engineer and, prof and professionals like Kaiser were very proud of their status. And even today there's a, there's a big organisation called uh, OzIMM, which is the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. So professionals in mining still very, very much look after their, 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 their status and, their, and uh, promote their importance. So I think for Kaiser, it was a matter of um, uh, mine, mine managers are the people who, who manage mines. It's not up to directors. Directors shouldn't be telling mine managers how to, how to operate a mine. And so there's this clash of professional status and amateur, and amateur uh, status. So this is a house, and I think uh, Peter and Sue have got a, a much better photo of uh, this, this house at Forth. This is the house where James and Mary Jane Smith lived in the years 1875 to 97, so the whole of their, their married life. Uh, and it's now stuck behind the roadhouse. So, having left the, the Mount Bishop Tin Mining Company, James Smith had lots of other things to do. Um, he, had, he and Mary Jane had six children. James, uh, I told you, he started out with a 640-acre estate, uh, sorry, a 640-acre lot at Forth, and he sold 150, 100, sorry, he sold 500 acres, leaving 140. Well, eventually he had 1,600 acres. It was a very Victorian era thing to take the money that was in mining shares uh, and cash it in and put it into property. Mining was high risk, mining shares was high risk, property was not high risk. So that's what he did. He invested a huge amount of money in, in real estate. He also invested a huge amount of money in mining. Uh, and he pumped it back into mining. He was a great believer that Tasmania would be the greatest mining province in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so, in particular, he poured money into the Zeehan field uh, at a very difficult time in the 1890s when there was a, an economic depression going on. And it was in this house where he was depicted, often in words, philosophising in his laboratory and study. It was often said he was more comfortable uh, surrounded by his books than he was dealing with people. And he became the elder statesman of Tasmanian mining, very important figure in the fourth community and also in politics. And I don't just mean the two years he had in the Legislative Council. He was a great campaigner for the North West in terms of uh, getting the railway, getting roads and bridges built, infrastructure. And at this time, he was fated as a popular hero, recognised by the government, presented with a silver salver, uh, which is the object there. And there are these comparisons made uh, with great explorers like uh, David Livingstone, Henry Stanley and, and others, uh, even Australian explorers. And imperial heroes, he was cast as an imperial hero, like uh, Gordon of Khartoum. And this is one of the, uh, the last photos taken of Flosser, again this is in, in over there on the wall, uh, taken at Zee in about 1896, James Smith, it's just great to see uh, not just a portrait of his upper body and, and head, but here we have the, the full figure. So he hadn't put on a lot of weight uh, by, by uh, the age of 68. He was still looking in pretty good shape. And by this time, he had been reborn as a prospector. He was actually returned to the bush and was trying to find, uh, trying to make new discoveries. So I just want to deal briefly with the early days at Bischoff. Uh, so this is a couple of photos taken in 1886 when the mine is just beginning. Well, it's not just beginning, it's actually in its prime. Um, really interesting to see, you've got all these miners' cottages along Camp Road, a few of them are still there of course, but also here are the, the la here's the last of the forest that's been ringbarked, waiting to fall. And in this top photo, uh, quite extraordinary, this is looking down off the top of Mount Bischoff, and that, those houses in the foreground, that's not Waratah, that's the houses on the Don Hill, which is that hill right up next to Mount Bischoff. That was covered in uh, miners' cottages. And you can see Waratah in the distance amidst this huge forest that still exists in that period. 
This is uh, taking the same time. Um, this is uh, the Stanhope and Don Company mills. Uh, so the waterfall is just out of sight, uh, around to the left. Top of the hill you can see the Stanhope smelter, uh, and then the, down below that the original Waratah Hotel. Here's the original Bischoff Hotel. Um, and you can see just here the original Post and Telegraph office. <coughs> so by this time, quite a substantial community. And uh, just want to say a little bit about the, water, the extraordinary water power that was used. Again, I think you might have seen this picture. So one time, seven water wheels utilising the Waratah Falls at the same time. Uh, and Geoffrey Blaney wrote that uh, the, the use of water power here was as extensive as anywhere in Australia, any other mine in Australia. So that, that uh, water wheel at the top left, that's at the West Bischoff, down on the, near the Arthur River. Uh, that was shot of, wonderful Robertson shot of water power. So just looking at some of the relics you'll see today of the mining at Bischoff. Um, this is the West Bischoff Mill, and uh, the big water wheel's gone, but there's plenty of, plenty of artefacts from that, still down near the Arthur River. This is the, uh, the Bischoff Extended uh, Calciner, that big chimney, and uh, the big cuttings of the West Bischoff uh, Tramway. And of course, Bischoff itself, the great dam and water system, uh, the wonderful um, power station, which is now in a, a greater state of collapse than that. And, uh, of course, the other legacy, the acid mine drainage, which is still uh, rather prevalent in places. So, just to finish up with uh, James Smith, this is uh, James and Mary Jane Smith's graves in the Congregational Cemetery in Forth with this view of the Forth River. Really appropriate place. Um, with this view because of the attachment that James had with the Fourth River. Also his compatriots W.M. Crosby and William Raymond who uh, were, also had a really strong connection. They both pined on the upper Fourth River. Uh, there with him look, with that outlook over the Fourth. So just to conclude, I want to leave you with these thoughts about James Smith. He had this Tremendous determination to prove himself, an indomitable spirit, which uh, of course resulted in the discovery of tin at Mount Bischoff. Had an inquiring mind, self-educated, pious, highly principled and charitable. This legend still exists of him as a self-defeating man who sold himself out of a fortune and it's just not true. Smith, uh, and Smith said, oh, Smith sold all his shares before if they paid a dividend. Well, it's not true at all. He retained Mount Bishop's shares until his death. As I said, what he did do was he took these high-risk mining shares and turned some of it into real estate. So he was one of the few mineral prospectors to profit from his great discovery. And something that uh, Gavin's already alluded to, Mount Bishop was a great boost to the Tasmanian economy and particularly to the Tasmanian self-belief because of this stigma of convictism that's so uh, oppressive when it was a colony. Oh, Van Diemen's land and Tasmania when it was a colony. I think I'll leave it there. But, um, thanks for uh, your attention.